It's my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker. Keith Devlin is of Irish descent, born in Hull in the Lake Country of England, earning his bachelor's degree in mathematics at King's College London in 1968, and his PhD in mathematics at the University of Bristol. At Stanford University, Devlin is co-founder and executive director of Stanford's University Human Sciences and Technologies Advanced Research Institute, co-founder of Stanford's Media X University Industries Research Partnership Program, and senior research, or excuse me, senior researcher in the Center for Study of Language and Information. He is the author of some 34 books and 80 research articles. His books are split between formal mathematical works and those of more popular interest. He was awarded the International Pythagoras Prize and the Carl Sagan Prize for science popularization. He was a regular columnist for the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom from 1983 to 1991, centering on math and technology. Currently, he's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post. Since 1994, he has been the math guy on NPR's Talk of the Nation Science Friday. Devlin has been called upon to translate the most complex subjects into clear language for listeners of all ages, all of us. Using examples and experiences from learners' daily lives, like riding a bike and playing video games, Devlin explains mathematical theorems and concepts to people of all ages and all levels of knowledge. Keith and I became fast friends after he applied for the Dean of Science at St. Mary's College, and I had the joy of hiring him as Dean of Science in 1993. We then worked together till about 2000. It was seven very great years. In fact, we referred to it lovingly with our colleagues. It was the Dream Dean Team. One of the things I appreciated most about Keith, and there are many things I appreciate about him, is that every year he taught a course, he picked the most remedial course possible. He wanted to see each year if he could make math relevant to those who were the most adverse to learning the subject. And because he did that every year, it kept him always on a cutting edge. Will you welcome Dr. Keith Devlin? So, hello everyone. Um, back in 1993, uh, the year when some of you were born, your president, Bill Hines, was in the process of hiring me to be his Dean of Science at St. Mary's College of California, over the hills behind you, where he was the academic vice president. The selection process lasted a couple, or at least the interview process lasted a couple of days. In addition to many interviews with faculty and administrators, Bill and his wife Margie took me out to dinner one night in one of Lafayette's fine restaurants. At some point in the evening, one of them, I think it was Margie, asked me what really motivates me in life? Why do I do the things I do? I had, after all, taken a number of huge gambles with my life and career. The first risk was my decision at age 16 to stay in school and pursue a dream to go to university. Today, that hardly sounds like a risk. But to a young boy born and growing up in the industrial, fishing and port city of Hull in post-Second World War England, it was more than a risk. It was a challenge to my schoolmates to beat me up for having, as they used to put it, ambitions above my station. That was 1950s UK. A challenge, by the way, which I finessed <coughs> by, becoming one, <coughs> me, by becoming one of the school's star rugby players. Almost every problem has a solution. Becoming a star player in the mature sport of choice in Hull gave me considerable freedom to spend a lot of time with my head buried in books. Although, truth be told, I liked rugby, but this is a commencement speech, 
So I'm supposed to impress on you the values of hardship and self-sacrifice. For back then, society's expectations in the working class community where I grew up was that boys left school at 16 and started to bring money into the family and girls got married and had babies. Goodness how times have changed, for the better, I think I should add. And though my parents supported my decision and stood by me as I stayed on for two final optional years at school and then three years undergraduate study in London, they couldn't really afford it, but they did. But deep down, I think they felt a little bit ashamed that their son was not pulling his weight in society. Back then, my decision made me an outsider. There were several other times in my life when I chose the path less traveled. I took another chance in the early 1970s, not long after I got my PhD in mathematics. I was offered a junior faculty position at Oxford. The smart decision would have been to take it. But I also had an opportunity to go to Germany to work for a year, just one year, with the leading mathematician in my field at the time. One option offered me an entry ticket to a comfortable life as an Oxford academic. The other was temporary, and at the end of the year, I would need to find another job. But it would be a possibly once in a lifetime opportunity to work alongside the best person in the world in my area. I could not resist the exciting prospects of that one year. I took it and never looked back. And for the next 10 years, I traveled the world doing research and giving lectures on the work I started in that one year in Germany. Took another gamble in the early 1980s when I stopped doing research in classical pure mathematics and started to look for ways to use mathematical ideas in understanding human communication. That was largely untrod territory and it was not clear it would lead anywhere useful. But as a result of that work, in 1987, I was invited to Stanford and have been attached in one way and another to that university ever since. But to get back to Bill and Margie Hines in that Lafayette restaurant, the answer I gave to their question about what motivates the big decisions I make was this. I did not want to find myself on my deathbed wondering, what if? Asking myself, what would life have been like if I had not turned my back on an opportunity that came my way? After all, if something doesn't work out or you find you don't like it, you can always try something else. But if you pass an opportunity, chance if you pass on an opportunity, if you passed on an opportunity, chances are it may never come your way again. And then you'll always be left wondering. Back in Hull, when I had the opportunity to change my life through education, I took it. As a result, I've led a life far different from most of the other kids I went to school with back in Yorkshire. Many of them never left. Perhaps they led happy lives and were, or are, content. All I know is, it would not have been enough for me. And only you, the members of the class of 2014, can know what works best for you. You will certainly not be lacking in choices. When I compare the life I have been able to lead with the lives people led in previous generations, it's clear there's been a major shift. The rapid growth in science and technology that began in the first half of the 20th century meant that when I was born in 1947, not only was life expectancy itself much greater than at any earlier age, as a result of improved diet, better hygiene, and major advances in medicine, but the pace of change went up dramatically and continues to accelerate. In the late 1970s, I started to use a new experimental technology that allowed computers to communicate with one another. Back then, that was called the ARPANET in the United States. I was at the University of Lancaster in the northwest of England, but by connecting to the ARPANET through a gateway at University College London, I was able to start using a cool new tool called email. Back then, computer networks and email were used only by a relatively small number of university researchers. We felt like, and were, pioneers in a new online landscape. One of the main hubs for online life was Stanford University. Through email, I was able to start collaborating with researchers at Stanford. 
And a few years later, in 1987, I received that invitation to come over to Stanford for a year to work in an exciting new think tank called the Center for the Study of Language and Information, which had been created to try to figure out what the benefits might be of networking computers together. I have to admit that none of us saw the World Wide Web or e-commerce as potential uses. So much for foresight. I didn't know it at the time, but my life was about to make yet another major change of direction. Because after my year at Stanford came to an end, I didn't return to the UK. There was just too much going on in and around Stanford and Silicon Valley. People often ask me, what's the big secret behind Silicon Valley's continued success? It comes down to three factors, history, geography, and attitude. The history part is the Cold War. The Second World War began as old-style warfare and ended through scientific and technological warfare. When that conflict was over, the US faced a new adversary, its former ally, the Soviet Union. The Cold War was fought not on the battlefields or the oceans or in the skies, but in universities, laboratories, and the emerging high technology companies. Though high tech was not new to the Bay Area, starting in the 1950s, the government allocated billions of dollars to stimulating the building of a massive new technology complex in the Santa Clara Valley. Replacing the orchards that led to its earlier nickname of the Valley of Heart's Delight, with the seemingly endless sprawl of houses, shopping malls, and tech companies that gave rise to its new nickname, Silicon Valley. Carried along with this wave of growth, and in due course partially leading it, Stanford University went from being a sleepy little liberal arts university to an international research powerhouse. Well, that's the history part. Why is Silicon Valley where it is? That's the geography part. Stretching 50 miles from San Francisco in the north to San Jose in the south, bounded by the coastal mountain range to the west and the San Francisco Bay to the east, the Santa Clara Valley was flat, largely uninhabited farmland that could quickly be turned into a vast network of roads, housing, and the one or two story simple empty box buildings needed for the new high-tech industries. It was served by three Bay Area airports and had many colleges and universities, one of which, Stanford, had a structure that enabled it to work with both federal and industrial funding in a way that only MIT is able to emulate. Actually, I think we emulate them, but don't tell them that. <laughs> Climate and the surrounding terrain and outdoor recreational opportunities also played a role, providing an irresistible magnet to the kinds of smart, well-educated young people that make up the bulk of any high-tech workforce. They flocked there in their tens of thousands. I, too, found the entire work, culture, recreational package irresistible when I first moved there in 1987. So, by the way, did my two then teenage daughters who still live in the Bay Area. The third part of the equation that made Silicon Valley is attitude. Uh, by the way, only a mathematician can get away with talking about an equation having three parts. <laughs> but I am a mathematician. So attitude, the third part. Being created rapidly from nothing Silicon Valley was not held back by history, traditions, or culture, which can cripple innovation. New technologies were being developed in a new location by people new to the area, coming from all over the world. Everyone was doing something new, learning as they went along. And with that came the most powerful factor there is in innovation. Complete absence of fear of failure. The rest of the world sees Silicon Valley as a place of huge successes. To those of us who live and work there, it's a place of endless failures. For every Cisco, Intel, Yahoo, Google, or LinkedIn, there are hundreds of failed startups. Companies fail every day in Silicon Valley. But whereas in most parts of the world, having launched a company that failed might make others reluctant to hire the founder or invest in their next enterprise, in Silicon Valley, exactly the opposite is true. For what Silicon Valley is really about is not technology, not even ideas for technology or for their uses. Rather, it's about people. 
people who are willing to take risks and when they fail are able to dust themselves off, reflect on why things went wrong, learn from that experience and try again and again and again and again until one time you get it right. Coming from England, an ancient country with hundreds of years of straight-laced tradition, I found the Silicon Valley attitude to risk-taking and failure totally liberating. And I'll give you one personal example of many. A few years ago, I worked as a consultant to a large video game company that I'm not allowed to tell, but you can guess, that wanted to build an MMO, a massively multiplayer online game, that would help kids learn mathematics. Four years later, when it became clear that this was much more difficult than anyone had anticipated, the company decided to, stop, to drop the project. At that point, I could have just left it. I lived in one of the most attractive, affluent places on the planet. I had a full-time position at one of the best, most wealthy, and most prestigious universities in the world. I could lead a comfortable life into retirement. But although that game studio realized that genuinely educational MMOs were not financially attractive in their terms, in the course of four years working on the project, I learned how to embed deep mathematics into video game interactions and not spoil the game. So when the studio pulled the plug, I called up some of the folks who had been working with me on the project and told them I was going to found a company to design and build the next generation of mobile games for mathematics learning. And several of them decided to join me. The result was Brainquake. We released our first math learning game for iOS and Android last fall. It's called Was It's Trouble? And this year we'll be releasing other products. I think it's a powerful indicator of the possibilities av available today that in the same year I became eligible for social security benefits and life on a pension, I was able to release the first product of my own company and contemplate a whole new life as an entrepreneur. So just think, how much more can a young person graduating today achieve? How much more can each of you, the class of 2014, achieve? Yeah, you read a lot of hand-wringing articles in the press about how difficult life is in today's world, how young people face difficulties that previous generations did not, which is true. But remember this. The people who write those articles mostly make a living writing about what other people do. That's a good profession, and it serves a valuable role in society. But just as policemen have a wholly inaccurate view of the crime rate, because they spend a lot of their time dealing with crime, and security agents have a ludicrously exaggerated sense of the dangers of terrorism because they spend their days trying to prevent it, as we pay them to do. So, too, the folks who comment on society and its problems develop a very lopsided view of the opportunities available to a young person setting out today. The fact is, the opportunities are there, waiting for you to take advantage of, more than ever. All you have to do is be willing to take risks. Learn to view failures as just very necessary steps on the road to success. As a good rule of thumb, if you're not failing at least two-thirds of the time, you're not really trying hard enough, and you're not going to maximize your potential. I'm going to leave you with a quote from a basketball player that I came across recently. He says this, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. Sounds bad, no? All those failures? But there's one more sentence. He goes on to say, and that's why I succeeded. His name is Michael Jordan. Thank you and congratulations, the class of 2014. Keith, it's my pleasure on behalf of the trustees of Holy Names University to present this 
Doctorate of Humane Letters Honoris Causa for illustrious service to humanity and nobility of spirit, and you have been admitted to the ranks, it'll happen in a few minutes officially, of the graduates of the class of 2014. Thank <laughs> you.